Um, I'm going to preach a message this morning called The Good Life. Now, there's been a number of uh, pop songs over the years that have been called The Good Life, or uh, there's one recently that came out called Happy. Uh, You might have heard it. They are all stupid. (laughs) Uh, Because truthfully, nobody knows what it means to experience a good life, whoa, a good life without Jesus Christ. It's impossible. Uh, You might have a good life compared to others, but until you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can never fully understand what living a good life is like. Uh, Life with Christ is completely different than anything that circumstances can provide. And so this morning we're going to talk about how to live a good life because the truth is that, that there's a lot of people out there that think they're living a good life and they might appear to be happy to other people. And there's a lot of Christians out there that are living a pretty miserable life because they don't realize the joy that's inside them. They don't realize the hope that the gospel brings. Uh, you know, I bet you if we were to ask, I won't do it, but, but if I were to ask in here, how many people have been led to the Lord by another believer who is cranky and, uh, and grumpy and, you know, life-sucking, basically, <laughs> Christian? I would say that very few of us would be in that boat this morning. And the truth is, nobody wants to be like those kind of people. So that's what happens. If, if you're, if you're a, a crabby, mopey, life-sucking Christian, you're not going to lead anybody to the Lord because nobody's going to want what you have. But if you have the joy of the Lord in your heart and that joy comes out and it shows up on your face, <laughs> then you're going to have people excited to have what you want. So we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning, but before we do, we're going to go back and we're going to review what the gospel is, all right? Now, most of you have heard this before. Uh, You've probably heard it many times, but I think it's one of those things that it's good to hear every once in a while, and it's good to review. And so what I'm going to ask you to do this morning is, as I go over each of these five things that really underlie what the gospel is and what it means to us, I'm going to ask you to agree with me. And when I say agree, I mean verbally. Okay, so let me give you some examples, because some of you are good at this and some of you aren't. You can say things like, that's right, that's fine, that's fine, or yes, yes is a good affirming response, amen is good. My personal favorite is come on. <laughs> now, now let me spell that for you, it's C apostrophe M-O-N, it's a real word, okay? No, I'm just, it's not a real word, but... It, you know, if you want to get real crazy this morning, you could even, like, mix it up a little bit and go, come on, that's right. <laughs> you know? So, some of you are uncomfortable with this. If you grew up, like, Lutheran or Catholic, like, the only time you respond in church is if you're reading off a page or you have something memorized that's the, the correct response. That's all right. I grew up Lutheran, too. I'm a Lutheran, Lutheran costal. So, um, you guys can just join in that way. And the reason I'm having you do this is because it's good to affirm what we believe. It's good to agree together. It's good to vocalize it. The Bible says that, that uh, what you confess with your mouth is actually what saves you. So we're going to proclaim it together. We're going to proclaim the gospel. So if you would just agree with me this morning, that would be awesome, and I'd appreciate it. Sound good? All right, that was, that was maybe a three on a scale of one to ten. We can do better than that. All right. Number one, you were born messed up. (laughs) Romans 5.12 puts it this way, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. You were born sinful. Congratulations. (laughs) From the moment you were born, you entered into a broken relationship with Christ. Everything was messed up. Everything was in desperate need of a work of restoration. And that's what Jesus provided. Uh, You didn't create the problem. You inherited the problem. You didn't even get a chance to mess it up. You were born messed up. And there was nothing you could have done to prevent that problem. Number two, your problem was internal, not external. That was terrible, guys. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) try that again. Your problem was internal, not external. Yeah. All of us also lived among them at one time. This is Ephesians 2, 3. Gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. 
It started on the inside. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. If you know anything about medicine today, there are two types of medicine. One kind of medicine treats symptoms, and one kind of medicine treats the disease. And if there is no medicine that treats the disease, then the only option is for you to treat the symptoms. But if you're on medication and you've been through this before, you know the complications and the problems that arise when you only treat the symptoms. It's a constant struggle of get, getting the right balance of medication, and, and medication has side effects and it creates all sorts of other problems. If you cannot cure the disease, you're going to constantly struggle. You're going to constantly come back to that. And we as Christians, we often try to treat the symptoms rather than treating the disease. Rather than letting God change us from the inside out, we focus on the things that are external and we try so hard to deal with our sin rather than deal with the reason why we're sinning in the first place. The gospel message means that you can be set free from that sin, that it doesn't have to hold power over you anymore. But if you try to do it on your own, you're going to constantly be struggling over and over again. You're going to end up in this cycle. Uh, For example, if you're struggling with an addiction to pornography, you can break your computer, you can cancel your cable subscription, you can have 15 different accountability partners, but if nothing changes in your heart, If you don't allow God to change your heart, you might be able to control the symptoms for a while, but inside you're still broken. You're still sick. But God comes into a situation, and when you allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart, he actually changes who you are. He changes your very nature so that that the essence of who you are ultimately shifts to a better person. It's impossible to become a better person on your own. But God comes and changes your heart. So eventually those sins will rise to the surface again and find a new way to manifest themselves. But if you let God change your heart, it can change your actions as well. Number three, you can't fix yourself. You cannot fix yourself. Here's what Romans 7.15 says. I do not understand what I do. for For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. That's a mouthful. But it's so true, right? It, you, you don't want to sin. You don't want to fall into that pattern over and over again. But unless you allow God to change, you cannot fix yourself. The whole idea of reconciliation and redemption is that which is broken needs to be fixed. So where it all goes wrong, we think if I clean up myself, God will accept me. All I need is a better version of me. Well, a better version of something that's broken is still broken, right? Let me give you an illustration. I've been, I've been married for seven years now, and uh, when, when we got married, we had these, uh, this set of glasses, right? Drinkware, right? You know, and I don't break glasses, <laughs> but my wife tends to break glasses, okay? Let me put it this way. We've had four different sets of glasses over the last 16 years we've been married. Each one has about 16 glasses. Okay, so do the math, right? Four times 16. Anybody? 64? Sound about right? We probably have about 20 right now. <laughs> we'll put it that way. There's a lot of glasses that, that break in our house. Now, now, this is purely hypothetical because this wouldn't actually happen. But let's just say for, for this, for the possible explanation here that I broke a glass, right? And my wife broke a glass. We both broke a glass on the same day. Now, my glass only broke into 20 pieces, but Laura's glass broke into 45 pieces. Now, which glass is less broken? (laughs) They're both broken, right? You can't drink out of a glass in 20 pieces any more than you can out of the one in 45, If you're born broken, a better version of yourself is still broken. God wants to repair you. He wants to make you whole again. So stop trying to drink out of a broken glass. It doesn't work. You cannot fix yourself. You cannot fix the problem on your own. Now, here's how we try to deal with that brokenness. First thing we do is we try to find a a better version of ourself. And, uh, That never works. The second way is uh, we try to find it 
fulfill ourselves with somebody else. We try to find that, that person that, that can fulfill that relationship. You know, I was, a few months back, I was doing marriage counseling with a couple, and uh, we, I always ask the question, why do you love the other person, right? And, uh, and she answered, and it was all mushy and gushy, and then, and then he answered, and he said, you know, this might sound cheesy, but she, she completes me. I said, yeah, that is cheesy. <laughs> That's, that sounds like something out of a Tom Cruise movie, right? <laughs> no, uh, it is cliche. It is cheesy. The truth is, no person can ever complete you. <laughs> if you're looking to another person to complete you, you're only going to end up broken more. Because the truth is, they're broken too. Two brokens, broken plus broken, does not equal fixed. Right? It's just more brokenness. It's, it's a bigger mess than, than even before. You know, sin is kind of like one of those things. You see it, and you know it's going to happen, and it's like, it's, like it's, in, it's, it's in slow motion in front of you. You, you know you're going to fall back into it again because you haven't changed who's inside of you. But you're, you're trying so hard to do something about it. This is a real fresh illustration here, okay? This happened yesterday. Uh, and so it just kind of fit exactly what I want, how I wanted to communicate it. But the other day I, was, I, was, uh, I had my infant in my arms. She's seven, eight months old now? Eight months. See, that's good. I know how old she is. And uh, I was carrying her down the stairs. And I had a, a baby walker, you know, in my other hand because I was going to set her in the baby walker so I could, you know, do something else and keep her entertained. And my other daughter, my four-year-old, was playing on the steps and with her Barbies or something like that. And, and so I'm walking down the stairs, and I'm carrying the baby in this hand. I got the walker in this hand. Well, as a part of this walker, there's a, there's a little part that sits on the top that's kind of an accessory. And I thought it was part of the walker. <laughs> the truth is, it wasn't. It was just kind of sitting there loose, right? So it's, it's just in there. So I'm carrying it by this, and as I'm walking down the stairs the little walker falls from the thing that I'm holding. And it drops down the stairs, and, and it literally is like time slowed down. And it's one of those, no, you know. So I'm watching it as it goes down the stairs, and it rolls at first, and then it bounces off the stairs. And my four-year-old is standing at about three steps from the bottom, and it bounces like, you know, perfectly right in front of her so that it goes up and hits her square in the face, right on the side of the head. And I'm watching this whole thing happen. And so she goes backwards down the steps, lands on the ground, and the walker lands right on top of her. <laughs> Panic, right? You know, run down the stairs. Are you okay? Are you dead? You know, she was fine. You know, she was, she, she was fine in a few minutes. But, but it was one of those things where I could see exactly what was going to happen, but there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. That's the way sin is without Christ. You know it's going to happen, and there's nothing that you can do about it. You cannot stop it on your own. And so it's like you're watching this take place in front of your eyes, and you're like, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, but it's happening again. That's what happens when we try to fix ourselves. So the, the last way we try to do it is by getting connected in the right group of people. right? If I could only be a part of this group then all my problems would be solved. You know, if we could just get past that junior high mentality, <laughs> we'd have a lot less problems. <laughs> right? The, how many know the cool kids still exist when you're 40? Right? And everybody wants to be a part of a certain group, and you think, if I'm part of that group, that will fulfill my problem. That will meet my need. But the truth is, that's just a bunch more broken people. And you go into that group as well, and you end up in the same situation. So after that doesn't work, then we turn to God, right? No, first we got to try other things. We got to try to fulfill that brokenness, that emptiness with stuff. So we try to make a lot of money. And, and if we make a lot of money, then we can buy a lot of toys. And those toys will maybe fulfill that. But the truth is we realize that's not what we were missing in the first place. And that doesn't help us either. And so after we're desperate, after we've gone through all these different things to try to fulfill us, and there's probably a million more that I'm not even talking about this morning, 
we get to this point where we realize we need Christ. And the truth is that even in our idiocy, where we go through those steps over and over and over again, and we finally come to Christ and say, okay, God, I'm willing to try it your way, he still takes us in our brokenness. And that's the next one. Jesus takes us broken and makes us whole. Luke 4.18, this is Jesus quoting the prophet Isaiah. This is what he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. That's the hope we have. That's what it's all about. That is the gospel message right there. Jesus lived a sinful light. From the moment he was a little child, he was, you know, I was a goody two-shoes when I was a kid. Uh, I didn't get in trouble very much, but I remember very distinctly one time in kindergarten that I got in trouble. And uh, we had two kinds of blocks in kindergarten. We had like the big cardboard stacker blocks, and those were great for building forts, right? So we would build two forts, you know, on the opposite side of the room, and, 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 Ultimately, when you have two different opposing forts, you have to, like, you know, launch a bomb or something at the other fort, right? So we had two kinds of blocks, and the other blocks weren't being used anything. Uh, the problem was they were made of solid wood. So <laughs> they don't make those for kids anymore because they're too dangerous because of kids like me. But, you know, they were probably six inches long, solid wood blocks, and, and they made great projectiles, so if you were hiding in your fort, you could kind of lob it to the other side of the room, and it would go right over the top of the wall and hit the kids in the other fort on the other side. So we started, you know, just lobbing them over, and after a while we discovered, you know, if you throw them hard, they'll knock down the other wall. <laughs> so by the end of this day, we were throwing wooden blocks back and forth at each other, and it hurt when you got hit, but, but nobody wanted to quit because it was a lot of fun. And I remember the teacher walked into the room and looked and saw what was going on. Her eyes just went like, oh my goodness, what's going on? And I'm like mid-throw with a block, and I see her, and there's nothing I can do to stop. Again, it's slow motion, (laughs) you know? My arm can't stop, and that block flies out of my hand. I got in so much trouble, we had to put our heads down on the table. That was the punishment back in kindergarten. And I was humiliated. Like, this was the worst thing ever for me. I was there with my head down on the table, completely ashamed. Well, I tell you all that to tell you that Jesus never had one of those moments when he was a kid. Right? He lived a sin, sinless life. I bet you he didn't even bite another kid in the nursery. You know? <laughs> uh, he lived a blameless life, went to the cross, and took the entire sin of the world on him. He took all of the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why aren't we destined for wrath? Because God used it all up on Jesus. Jesus absorbed all of God's wrath for us. There's no wrath left. So you don't have any wrath in your life because Jesus took it all for you. That's the hope that we have. Here's what Ezekiel chapter 36 says. I know you guys spend a lot of time in Ezekiel in the Word. It's one of those books that that people read grudgingly. But this is an amazing verse hidden in chapter 36, uh, verse 25, and we're going to read through 29. It says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put inside you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. God comes in, and he completely restores us. He gives us a new spirit. We're completely made new. But then, number five, God fixes our broken hearts and our broken behavior. So he doesn't just change who we are on the inside, but who we are on the inside, which is now new, which is now regenerated, changes the way that we act. And if you continue to read that passage in Ezekiel, Verse 27, it says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And be careful to obey my rules. You will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, 
and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. God doesn't leave you the way you are. You can't fix yourself so he does it for you. Psalm 23 says he leads us in paths of righteousness. Why does he do it? For his name's sake. It brings glory to God. When you honor him with what you do, with, your, with the righteousness that he's put inside you, as that comes out in your life, that honors the name of the Lord. And it honors him in front of the nations around you. So other people see your good works and they glorify your Father in heaven. So he makes us a new creation. He restores us. He changes us. Now we can be happy. Right? Now we can live the good life. Uh, we're going to look at a passage of scripture today. Uh, that someone, somewhere along the way, labeled the Beatitudes. I hate that name. <laughs> it's, to me, it, it paints this picture. It paints this picture of something that you really have to, to white-knuckle and strive to do. When the truth is that when God puts his spirit inside you, that's the nature of who you are. So we're going to, you know, change the name of it a little bit today. Um, the you are attitudes just doesn't have quite the same ring to it, but that's what we're going to call it for now. So the you are attitudes, and we're going to we're going to look at exactly what that is. So if you turn to me, turn with me to Matthew chapter five. If you have your Bibles with you today, otherwise the the words will be on the screen. And we're going to discover that that uh, blessing comes through some pretty counterintuitive measures. Um, now these. Most, most translations use the word blessed or blessed or however you want to say it. Um, the word that's used there is a word called mar- markarios. Okay? Uh, markarios can be translated blessed or blessed, but it can also be translated happy. All right? So it's kind of along the lines of umpa if you're Greek, okay? Markarios, right? It doesn't have the same effect as umpa, but you get the idea. It's a happy word. It literally means happy. So... When somebody says, I have the joy of the Lord, but I'm not happy, that's just ridiculous, okay? The joy of the Lord makes you happy. Try having the joy of the Lord in your heart and letting it come outside of you and not have a smile on your face. Good luck with that. (laughs) If you can do that, let me know. I want to see it. Um, But we're going to read through this passage, and then we're going to kind of break it down, and we'll move through this quickly this morning. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, so let's look at that first one. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I thought part of the gospel message was that Jesus restored us from our brokenness. I thought he made us whole. So why should we be poor in spirit when we have God's spirit living inside of us? Well, the truth is, being poor in spirit doesn't mean that you're mopey. It means that you realize that your spirit before Christ was nothing. And as he came and gave you a new spirit and raised you to life spiritually, everything changed. Being poor in spirit means recognizing where you came from and realizing how good it is to be set free from that. So we rely on the Spirit of God rather than our broken flesh, and we get a lot more out of life that way. And when we recognize where our hope comes from, then we stop trying to do it ourselves and disappointing ourselves and letting ourselves down all the time. But when we rely on the strength that's inside of us, that Christ put inside of us, and we realize where that came from, then we have hope, then we have joy, then we have the fulfillment of that verse. And we get to experience the kingdom of heaven right here on earth. 
Next one is, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, when the Spirit of God lives inside of you, and you sin, you feel awful about it, right? When you sin, you just have that ugh feeling in your stomach. And, and even when you make a mistake, it's, it's like, it's against the nature of who you are. God's life has been put inside of you, so now your sin disgusts you. And so we mourn in the sense that we're, we're sorrowful for the sin that we commit because that's not who we are anymore. And we don't want that to be a part of our lives. And, and what's the hope? When we turn to Christ, when we turn to him to change us, blessed are the mourn for they will be what? Comforted. The hope is in the forgiveness. Yes, we've sinned, but our comfort is this. Jesus Christ died for our sin, past, present, and future, and now we don't have to worry about that sin anymore. We don't carry the weight of that sin anymore. So while it hurts us to sin, while that's not God's plan for our life, while that's not what God has for us, ultimately, we're forgiven. And we mourn because of the sin in our lives, but we rejoice because of the hope that Christ gives us through forgiveness. God's grace is so incredible. Next one is, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, this verse is probably one of the most abused and and misused verses in the Bible. Um, Meek does not equal timid or passive. Uh, My Bible says that God didn't give us a spirit of fear or timidity, as some translations say, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So meekness is not timidity. So don't use that Bible verse as an excuse for your disobedience to what God is calling you to do. When God calls you to do something, he gives you everything that you need to fulfill the purpose that he's called you to. And some of us just don't believe that this morning because you would be doing it if you did. But the truth is, that meek people are the people who realize that everything that they have comes from God. So in the midst of your victories and success, as you operate in the Spirit of God, as He fulfills His purposes through your life, the meekness comes out in the sense that you know that everything that you have comes from Him, and there's an inherent humility in your heart, and people can recognize that. There's a difference between somebody who accomplishes great things for God because of what He did in their heart, than somebody who accomplishes things supposedly for the kingdom of God that they did on their own. Because if you do it on your own, you're going to be proud. But if you do it through the Spirit of God, there's going to be a humility there because you're going to realize that everything that we have comes from Him, that every gift that you have, every ability that you have comes from Him, and everything that you accomplish is because the Holy Spirit accomplished it for you. And when we begin to understand that, then we have a boldness in our heart. We're not scared. We're not timid. We're not fearful because we know that that something bigger than us lives inside of us. And that power that's from God, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, lives inside us, gives us the ability to do what we need to do. And we can have confidence in that. So now we're not scared anymore. We're not timid. We're not embarrassed about what we're doing because we know that he's called us to do it and he's given us everything that we need. Meekness is just recognizing who gives you that ability. And what what does it say? The meek will inherit the earth. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, now there's this is kind of um, the one that, that kind of pulls all these three together, those first three together. Because all of these things that are kind of happening internally creates something inside of us. And it's this hunger and thirst for righteousness. Um, you know, what's amazing about, about God's word is, is that the more you have of it, the more you want. When you experience the things of God, you can't help but want more. Uh, we gave our, our uh, eight-month-old daughter some ice cream last night. <laughs> and as she's eating it, she got excited, right? <laughs> so like that first bite was like, oh, I'm not sure about this. And then she tasted it and it's like, oh, ice cream is good. So then every time the spoon wasn't in her mouth, she was like, ah, ah, ah give me more, right? 
That's the way it is with, with God's things, with the things of God. As we experience them, we get excited about them, and the only thing we want is more and more and more of him. Now, it's kind of a paradox because ultimately, God gives us all the righteousness we're ever going to need the moment we receive him. But as we see that righteousness change our behavior, we're hungry for the things of God. We want more of him. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. And what does the verse say? It says, they will be satisfied. As you hunger and thirst for righteousness, God gives it to you. He fulfills it in your life. And you can be satisfied. You can be happy, fulfilled. All right, now the next three, we, went, we shifted from the first four, which are kind of internal things. The next three kind of shift to something that happens on the outside. And this one is, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. This is what grace does. When you realize the debt that you've been forgiven, when you realize what God has done in your life, you can't help but share that to others. You know, the, the, Jesus told the parable of, of um, the servant who owed a great debt, right? And that debt was forgiven to him. And then he went and, and tried to collect a far smaller debt from another person. I don't understand how people who experience God's mercy and God's grace and really understand who they were before Christ and who they are after Christ can look at a situation and be so hypocritical and judgmental. Because if you realize what God's grace is all about, then how can you not extend it to others? The people who struggle with that are the people who don't realize how much God has truly forgiven them of. They fail to see their brokenness before Christ and fail to recognize the greatness of what he's done for them. We've all been forgiven a great, great debt. And the more we realize that, the more that mercy, that compassion, that empathetic heart will come out towards people around us. And the more we'll be able to lead people to Christ as a result. Because when you have a gentle heart, when you have a a thankful heart for the mercy that God's bestowed on you, then your, your graciousness transfers to others. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. A pure heart is a heart that's aligned with God's heart. Now, that's not necessarily something that's, that's easy to do. Because... We have our own desires, right? We have things that our flesh wants. And so it's this battle between your spirit and your flesh, and, and ultimately, who's going to win out over your heart? And if you allow God's spirit to win in your heart, and allow him to download his heart for other people inside of you, then it changes who you are. Then it genuinely makes you a kinder, gentler person. Um, you can't make yourself be more kind or, or be more loving. That only comes through Christ downloading his heart into you. So the only way to make that happen, because you can't manipulate it, you can't fake it, people will see through that. The only way to get God's heart is to spend time with him. And as you spend time praying and spending time in the word of God and, and hearing his voice, then God begins to just give you that heart. He begins to download that inside of you and it literally transforms who you are. It literally changes who you are. That's, that's the hope that we have. That as we spend time with God, that we become more like him. That's, that's the only way it happens. You can try to manipulate it any way you want. Let me know how that works out for you. I'll tell you right now, you're going to struggle. I've tried it. I'm sure you have too. It doesn't work. But as you spend time in the presence of God, you become more like God. You grow to be more like God, and he changes who you are. Now, this next one is a difficult one. It's one that most people don't really 
like to think about. <laughs> persecution is awesome, right? We love persecution. We just we love being persecuted. <laughs> it says, "Blessed." Remember that word is interchangeable with happy. Happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we have a privilege of living in a country where we can believe what we want to believe without fear of persecution from the government. I don't have to worry about going into the foyer after the service today and being arrested. I don't think there are police officers waiting for me back there. Um, Maybe one of the ushers could let me know if there is. I'm going to go out the back way. But uh, we don't have to worry about that. So how does this apply to us? Um, you know, here's a real-life example. Let's say you work in a job in a corporate environment where uh, the nature of the job is somewhat deceitful and, and you work around people all the time that are constantly lying and manipulating and pushing the boundary of what's legal and illegal. And they approach you and are leaning on you to, to head a certain direction. Let's say you refuse to do that because you believe what the Bible says and, and you want to maintain your integrity. And as a result, they let you go from that job. That would be an example of persecution. Now, it's not as severe as being hauled away into prison and beaten for your faith, but ultimately there's a choice there. Are you going to choose your way or God's way? And, and the Bible says, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And, and I think there's going to be times in all of our lives where we're going to have the choice to choose God's way or the easy way. And ultimately, we all have to make that decision before we have that circumstance in our life. What is the decision I'm going to make? If I'm faced with this situation, what is the choice I'm going to make? Am I going to stand for my convictions because I believe that God is bigger than my circumstances and that he's able to meet my needs in those difficult circumstances? Or am I going to trust myself to find a way out of it and choose my way? And ultimately, if we make that choice that we're going to choose God's way no matter what, there's going to be situations in our life that are going to be tough decisions. And we're going to have to choose to do it God's way, and blessing is going to come. Now, if in that example that I gave, how could blessing come in that situation? Well, for one, you can lay your head down at night with a clean conscience. Right? You can, you can go to bed easy knowing that, that you did the right thing. You can also watch God's hand of provision in your life, because if you get let go from your job... You're going to have to learn to trust God to provide for you. You're going to have to learn to trust the body of Christ to rally around you and support you. Blessing can come in difficult circumstances. And life isn't always going to be easy, and we're not always going to have the easiest things in life because we're a Christian. It doesn't work that way. In fact, the Bible says you're going to face trials of many kinds. But our hope is in God who's going to get us through those circumstances. We have the Holy Spirit to comfort us. We have the body of Christ to surround us and lift us up in prayer. We have an amazing opportunity to develop our faith, to trust God in those difficult circumstances. And as a result, blessing can come. And we can put our hope in that this morning. Now, he doesn't leave it there. Because there's... there's a. Uh, that first part of the verse, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But then he goes on from there, and he says, blessed are you when others revile you. I don't even know what revile means, but it sounds terrible. And uh, persecute you and utter all kinds of evil. This is a key word, falsely on my account. Notice he said falsely. If they're saying things about you that are true, then something needs to change. But if they're falsely accusing you, then you take it as a blessing. Now, um, the church today has been, there's been some broad sweeping statements made about the church, right? Um, some of them are totally inaccurate. And what happens is they, the world uses a specific example of somebody who's an idiot under the name of Christianity, and they, 
they take that and they make a broad sweeping statement about the entire church. Right? The, the perfect example is something that's been huge in this state, and that's the example of same-sex marriage. Right? We, we had a, a big divisive debate, you know, last fall during, uh, during that whole uh, vote thing. Now, the truth is, um, most Christians, and I believe that, that this is uh, where we're at as a church, that most of the people here look at the, the gay community and we'd say, we love you, we care about you, we want you to find Christ. And, and we, we receive you, we welcome you here so that, that you can find a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of people out there that, that don't exactly have that same view. And they do a lot of dumb things. And so as a result, there's, we've been painted in with certain people who do stupid things. And as a result, this broad statement's been made about the church that we're all hypocritical, we're all bigots, we're all spiteful, we're all militant. In fact, I even saw a, pa- a post on Facebook the other day that uh, was comparing uh, Christianity to radical Islam. Um, there's some, that's, that's a pretty harsh comparison, right? Uh, and I don't know that, that the majority of the church has done anything to draw that comparison, to draw that. But ultimately, we're kind of painted in, into this corner. We're falsely accused of something like that. Now, the truth is, it needs to be false accusations. Right? So, we all need to look at our lives and say, are we showing the love of Christ to people outside of the church? Or do we really fit the description that they're painting of us? Now, what's amazing, what's happening in our country right now um, is that the church, for the first time in our country's history, is being pushed to the fringes of society. And what I mean by that is it used to be mainstream culture in America to attend church. And that dynamic is changing rapidly. And truthfully, I think it's a good thing. The reason is that being, going to church, being a Christian, is, is no longer your patriotic duty as an American. It's something that's real. It's something that's genuine. And, and ultimately, what that shift is doing is it's, it's making us rely on the Holy Spirit to change us. And as America becomes less of a Christian nation, I believe that the church will flourish because God's gospel is still real. It still changes lives, and it won't be watered down anymore by nationalism. Now, you might say, why are you hating on America? (laughs) I'm not hating on America. I love America, okay? (laughs) But my loyalty is to the kingdom of God. My loyalty is to his kingdom and his kingdom alone. And everything else is peripheral. And I want to see our church come together under the name of Jesus Christ, not under the name of of the the United States of America. And I want to see it move in a powerful way so that the Holy Spirit is transforming lives. That's what this country needs. And that will ultimately change us. Okay, so what do you do with this message? Great, I am these things, I'm happy. I still don't see them manifesting in my life. (laughs) I'm still crabby. (laughs) Woke up this morning, I was really crabby. (laughs) I'm struggling with this. So what are some action steps that I can take? Well, let's back up a little bit. Let's go back to that passage and see how it ends, right? So we get through the you are attitudes, I know it just doesn't sound the same. It doesn't have a good ring to it. But Verse 13, here's what it says. You are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill. Your light was not made to be hidden. Hide it under a bushel, oh no, right? Ultimately, what you do with this message is that this happiness, this joy, this blessing that's inside of you has to come out. It has to come out. So let's get real practical here. How do you do that? First way, I'm going to give you three action steps. If you want to write them down, that's awesome. If you don't, that's okay. 
Number one, be aware of your mission field. You know, most of us work a job in this place, and, and ultimately, your purpose at your job, your primary purpose is not to collect a paycheck. That's your mission field. God put you there for a reason. He put you there to establish his kingdom in your workplace. So you've been planted there to fulfill the Great Commission at your job. Now some of you that might be a challenge for, especially if you work by yourself. <laughs> you got, you're in a little cubicle and you never see anybody the entire day, but you could pray in your cubicle. You know, you can affect your workplace that way. God put you there for a purpose, so find out what it is. How do you find out what it is? Ask him. He'll tell you. You know, one of the greatest mission fields that we have in our country is our school system. And we're planting missionaries there all the time. You know, we have, we have some awesome teenagers in this church. And they need you to stand alongside them and encourage them and build them up and show them how to live the gospel in, in your life and so they can do it in theirs. Because ultimately, the majority of you here today accepted Christ for the first time before you were 18 years old. You know, if you think about it, the statistics say somewhere between 70 and 80%. Accept Christ for the first time before the age of 18. So we need to come alongside our teenagers because they have an opportunity that you don't have. So let's give them what they need. Let's, let's come alongside them. Let's encourage them. Let's help them to lead a generation to Christ. Number two, don't be intimidated by your fears. Can I just uh, share something? It's a little beef of mine that might make some of you mad. Is that Okay. Okay, I'm going to make the statement, try not to throw anything at me. Parents, specifically moms, <laughs> your primary job as a parent is not to keep your children from everything. Because whose kids are they? They're not your kids. He's entrusted them to you. He's given them to you to raise. But ultimately, their purpose is to serve him, to be a warrior for his kingdom. And God has called you to raise them up to fulfill that purpose that he's put in their heart. And so if you shelter them from every possible opportunity that they have to do that, what service are you doing them? Because ultimately, they're going to get to a real-world situation someday, and if they've never had the opportunity to succeed or fail in a safe environment like your home, how are they going to do it out in the real world? Now, there are moments in life where you need to exercise wisdom. I'm not saying send your 15-year-old kid to a strip club to go witness. <laughs> That's ridiculous, right? Right? So you need to show wisdom and discretion, but you need to give them opportunities to share their faith. You need to give them opportunities to express their hope in Christ as well, because ultimately they're God's kids, not yours. So back the helicopter up a little bit, right? Just a little bit. Ease back. Give them a little bit of room and allow God to do something amazing through them. I'm scared that we're raising a generation of sheltered Christian kids. Because ultimately, they're the hope for their generation. So we need to give them opportunities to experience the joy of living for Christ and sharing his love. You still love me? Okay, good. I was nervous. Absolutely not. All right. <laughs> One out of 15, that's not bad, okay. <laughs> Number three, rejoice and be glad. Here's, here's what it says in verse 12. We'll go back to it again. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted prophets who were before you. So your good news is that they persecuted the prophets before you. Think about what they accomplished for God. 
if you're in that same boat, you are in the same league as those prophets. You're right there with Jeremiah and with Isaiah and with Ezekiel. You're right there with all those different prophets who shared the gospel. Now, that might sound cool at the time, but let's, let's back up a little bit. Look at Isaiah. Look at his life. One of our most favorite passages of Scripture to quote is, is from Isaiah 6. And it's, Hear my Lord, send me. Right? We can make it, you can put it on a t-shirt. It looks great, right? Did you ever look at the rest of that chapter? Did you ever look at what Isaiah was being sent to do? His mission in life was to preach to a people over and over and over and over again, and God told them from the very beginning, they're not going to listen to you. Sounds like fun, right? You know, we rejoice in those circumstances, not because we love failure, but because we know that, that our hope, that our successes aren't based on what we accomplish monetarily or numerically, but great is our reward because we're building those rewards in heaven. God loved the people of Israel so much that he sent Isaiah to them to preach to them over and over again, knowing that they wouldn't listen to him. Now we have an even better message now that Jesus has come, an even greater hope, and we have the privilege of sharing it to a world. Some people are going to receive it, some people aren't. But if you keep it right here and never let it come out of you, never let that blessing, that joy come out of your life, then how on earth are you going to ever know what God could do through your life? I'm going to ask the worship team to, to come back up. And as we close today, I want to encourage you to do something, to, to take these action steps to heart. Ultimately, our purpose in life is to share the good news of the gospel. And when it's living inside of us, it gives us the opportunity to share that joy with others.